How's it going, everybody? For those of you who don't know me, my name is Drew, and this year I really took to a a dream, I guess you could call it, a dream of mine that is building guitars. And the reason that I say it's been a dream is that I can think back to when I was in college, there were some sketches and some ideas that I was playing around with to build my own guitars. And I kind of sat and brooded on it for multiple years now, and only recently have I developed the tooling and the means and kind of had the time to really dive into this dream of mine. And it's been an amazing adventure so far. So far, you guys have been super duper generous with spending some of your time with me and watching the various build videos that I've been putting up. But the thing about that is the last build video that I put up was like close to 50 or 60 days ago. That's like almost two months. And while I appreciate you guys' patience, I wanna do something a little bit more regular than that. And I was thinking to myself, well, there's some really great channels out there like Crimson Guitars who do like a week by week, what's on the bench sort of thing but they're a really well-established company and they do all these amazing things. They're developing luthier tools and they sell luthier tools and stains and all this other good stuff and nothing against them. They're doing amazing work. But as kind of an average Joe or an average Drew, if you will, and learning the craft, learning the art of luthery, I thought it would be kind of cool to document my own journey and see if we can take this burgeoning guitar company and turn it into a blooming guitar company. And who says it just has to be guitars? It could be instruments, it could be a whole bunch of different things related to music. And that's why it's called Mad Lad Instruments and not just Mad Lad Guitars. So with that in mind, I wanted to kick this series off and just take you guys week by week, blow by blow, through what it's like, what I've been working on, the projects that I'm working on, and also some of the behind the scenes stuff that you don't always see when it comes to building a guitar the design work, the business side of the house, and it could all land on its face and we don't get anywhere, or we could take it all the way to the moon and beyond, or we land somewhere in between and that's okay too. But the point is that you guys are along for the ride with me and we are all together on this little descent into madness. Okay, so first project we have on the bench today, a part of a larger project, is we have this beautiful flame maple neck with beautiful rose board and this beautiful, how many times can I say beautiful, <laughs> uh, beautiful inlay work. So in case you guys don't know how I do my inlays, I basically mix up some epoxy, pour it in, or I will route, I will CNC route the inlay work I'll drop epoxy into it, let it cure overnight, and then I come over and actually do the radius on the board, uh, all on the CNC machine, because your boy ain't that precise, but also for some of the accents and stuff like that, like I hand painted some of these, and I'm gonna retouch them a little bit. I think some of the line work could be a little bit better on these, but basically hand painting some of them, but the rest of it, this is actually a gorgeous effect. This looks almost exactly like a cherry blossom tree. It's kind of got that ashy kind of white color but with the epoxy and the mica powder it looks just gorgeous so really really happy with how this came out this is going to be going on a super s body and so the only other thing that we have to do is we have to do the fret markers on the left side the side that faces up because this is a right-handed normal guitar well left-handed isn't 
abnormal. It's just different. So, but you guys get what I'm saying. So that's the first thing that we're going to do today is we're going to get those front markers drilled in and glued in, and then we can actually get into the process. And I'll talk a little bit about the guitar that I'm going to be putting this on because that's kind of a fun story if you haven't seen the build log for it. So yeah, let's do this thing. Alrighty, there's those put in, glued in, and sanded down, minus this one over here and this one. I still need to, I had to re-glue this one, so I just snipped it with these and gonna sand that down, but I cannot get over how good this flamed maple looks in the camera, and it also looks amazing in person, even more so. So definitely, definitely worth every penny that I spent. Fun story, or I don't want to say every time that I spent, I was grasping for words there just a second ago. So I'll tell you guys a little story. I mentioned this on Instagram, but I have a really, really great supplier, McKinney Hardwood Lumber. The guy's name is Mike. He runs a really, really great operation. He knows how to pick them. This is actually rated, I guess he rates it on like an A scale. This was a 1A. And when I went in, I bought it. I got this one. And then you can see over there, there's two more blanks. And then... There's one over there that's going to be on that guitar, which we'll talk about in just a second. I was wondering, like, where's the third blank? I had four blanks, and I used one for this, and then there's that one, and then that, those two over there. But I was able to get four neck blanks out of it. And it's like, oh, yeah, I've had stuff that looks even better than that. I'm like, Mike, I'd like to see that, because this is just gorgeous. So Flame Maple, when you do it correctly, looks like a holographic Pokemon card or like a holographic trading card. Like, you move it, and it literally, like, shifts color and stuff like that. So it's really, really cool. Um, by the way, a little secret luthier tip, we might get to it on that neck, and if we do, I will tell you then, but if not, I'll tell you at the end of the video, there's a really, really easy way that you can get this really nice depth to it. It's just a little bit of linseed oil and Japan dryer, or as I say, boiled binseed oil and weed dryer, if you've seen my previous videos. But let's come over here and talk about this guitar for a second. So this is going to be a Super S. This is going to be inspired by Mr. Satoru Gojo from Jujutsu Kaisen. One of my favorite animes. I actually have Gojo tattooed on my calf. And where we're at on this one, beautiful black limba body. I love black limba as a material. It machines really, really well. And it's got this beautiful grain pattern. And to me, it kind of looks like it's a cursed object. Or there's like cursed spirits that are stuck within... The, the guitar, that's why it has this streaking. So it kind of goes with the theme, but beautiful, beautiful, beautiful figuring. First time I'm working with it. And we're gonna actually stain this. We're going to spray some color. We're gonna do like a gradient. I'll show you guys a little picture here. We're gonna try and get this finish on this guitar and what's in that bag will help us. But before we get that one step at a time, I have just put Aqua Coat on this. So Aqua Coat is a water-based grain filler. And when you have a really, really porous piece of wood like black limb, and what I mean by porous is if you look really, really closely here, each one of those little like slits, that's a pore. It's kind of like the pores in our skin, but wood has pore too. And bigger pore or more open pore wood like black limba needs to have a pore filler or a grain filler put into it so that it fills those up and you can sand it. Otherwise, if when you shoot it or you spray clear coat, all of the little divots in there are going to create divots in your finish and then it'll be uneven and you get what's called orange peeling which i've had some trouble with on previous guitars i'm getting better about it but grain filler helps with a lot of that and i'm also going to have to take around the edge i'm realizing that taking the edge here um you know sanding around the edge here with a high grid i've got my uh belt sander over there that i will get it all taken care of so with that in mind, we got to sand this down. We're on 400 grit. I'll talk about my progressive sanding schedule here in just a second too. All right, so something a little bit like this. I have no idea how this camera angle is working because the, the tripod that I have is a little bit uh, short and I'm a, kind of a tall guy, so hopefully everything's in, in frame, but I've got this guy sanded up to 600. 
And I take it if you're watching this video, you have some sort of interest in woodworking or some sort of interest in luthery, or maybe you are a luthier or woodworker yourself. And so with that, I won't regale you with sanding. You probably know what sanding is. There's people that don't even work in woodworking that know what sanding is. But what you may not know is my sanding schedule and how you go about sanding a guitar to get those nice glassy finishes and everything that you're talking about. And I will say that I am not the subject matter expert on this. I still have a lot to learn when it comes to finishing guitars and sanding guitars. But here's the basic breakdown of how I do it. So I typically don't start sanding a guitar with anything less than 150 grit. If I really need to sculpt or to contour the material and stuff like that, I'll start at a 150. Because when you get to like 60 and 80 grit, you can start removing stuff very, very quickly. And before you know it, your body is slack or it's it's scrap. and Or you're gonna spend a lot more time sanding out your mistake than you would have done if you just started at a higher grit. So I'll usually start with 150. 150 I'll usually use to contour like the edges here, like in the wings. There's usually what I CNC here. My CNC files will sometimes leave a little bit of a lip or the round over doesn't come over completely on the top. So I'll use the 150 to kind of come in and contour these edges and everything like that. Actually I had to do it on this Super S in particular. And then after that I start at 220. So I'll go up to 220, sand everything down, get it smooth. I will then apply my first coat of aqua coat, which is, like I said, the pore filler, grain filler that we talked about earlier. I will sand that down. You put on the first coat, you apply it very generously against the grain. You wait about 45 minutes, you sand it down about 320. You put on another coat, you let that one cure overnight, and then you sand it down to 400, which is what you just saw me do. So I did 400, now 600. And then I also took it over to my belt sander and I got it, got these edges around 240 and then I'll come back with the 600 pad and I'll come back and do it all manually again, which reminds me there are some edges in here that I have to, uh, a little bit of ASMR here for you. Um, some edges that I need to get. So I don't get it ready to spray or I don't ever spray a guitar for less than 600 grit because 600 is really where it's nice and flat and that's where I'll start. But anything under than that, in my experience, the you get a lot of orange pitting and it's not always as level. So you usually have to take the finish back, send it up to 600 anyway, and then start again. So it's a huge time sink. And again, I'm still experimenting and learning like the best ways to finish and stuff like that. But what has worked for me is, is what I just described. So 600 grit, you'll take it up to 600 and then you'll spray your first color coats, get your color down, looking good. Then I will usually just hit with like an 800 or a thousand grit just to kind of level everything off and then I'll start spraying clear coat. I'll usually do about four to six coats of clear coat, which is what you're gonna see me do here in a little bit. And then I'll let it, I'll sand up to about 2000 grit between those coats. So I'll spray two coats, a thousand, spray two coats, 1500, spray two coats, 2000. And then sometimes if I'm feeling really daring, I'll go up to like 3000 grit or something like that to get it really, really nice and polished. And then from there you, put it on ice. You let the guitar sit for about seven days to let the cure or the, uh, the top coat cure. I use polycrylic by the way, as the uh, finish for my top coat. So it's a lot easier to work with than um, nitro. I'm just gonna say nitro because I'm forgetting the exact com, the exact com, it's not nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin is an explosive. Ooh. Nitrocellulose. Nitrocellulose is the, the stuff that everybody is raving about, but Nitro is carcinogenic for one. It has a higher VOC count than polyacrylic. Uh, polyacrylic is just a mix of poly and acrylic. I use Minwax in particular, and it's got a lower VOC count. They're both bad for you. Like don't, of course, wear a respirator or anything like that, but nitrocellulose is used for like cars and stuff like that. So you gotta imagine the chemicals in that are meant to withstand like rain and weather and stuff like that too. So they're really, really durable. You don't want that stuff in your lungs, so. I tried nitro, it's just a lot more fickle and it takes a lot longer to cure and I just didn't see the payoff. Poly is way more fun to work with and easier to work with and I have yet to find a discernible difference in performance between the two, despite what many will say. But nitro has that magic jojo or that magic juju. It's what everybody used back in the day, like the old Les Pauls are finished in nitro and stuff like that. So there must be something to it, right? I digress, but I'm not gonna get into that argument right now. So. We'll do poly. All that's to say, progressive sanding, I usually start about 150 and I'll progress through 600. Then I'll start doing my finish and color and then I'll get it up to 2000 or 3000. And then we go into polishing and buffing, which is a whole nother talk. So 
you you learn to finish like if you can finish a guitar well you can finish just about anything well other woodworking projects you don't have to go through the same level of scrupulousness but uh i think with guitars if you can like i said if you can finish a guitar you can finish just about anything so enough of me yakking let's go ahead and get this guy in the spray booth and we'll, we'll mix some color and see how it looks Okay, so first coat went down and remember, it's about documenting the setbacks as much as it is the jumps forward. But a lot of overspray here, a lot of particulates. I know exactly why that is and that is because I didn't vacuum my spray booth and there's probably some dust and stuff in there, but all part of the process. So you guys are actually gonna to get to see me sand this down and uh, I could probably get most of the particulates and overspray out um, with just a little bit of sanding and a little bit of genteelness. And I'm still warming up on the, the white. It kind of came out as like a cool snowy gray, which I'll have to see how the gradient looks, but it might just work. I'm interested. I do want to keep the, the wood grain pretty exposed and the way that you do that is you can the more coats that you put on the more opaque because you're going to be putting on more coats and thusly more pigment because the pigment is blended into the top coat so the more that you put on the more opaque it is but if you only go at it with like one or two passes of each color you still get this beautiful effect again like I said all part of the process is coming together and it looks really really nice at least at the first coat so we will get the we will sand it back. Usually I wait about two hours at the very, very least. That's what they recommend for polycrylic to sand it back. So we're on the wait. And while we're doing that, we can come over here and get back to this neck that I was working. So we got the fret markers on the side. You saw that earlier, but now comes the part where we level the frets and get them radius because some of them don't want high frets because that will cause notes not fret properly. So let's get into that, shall we? So the setup for this is pretty straightforward. The, I'm always wondering like how much talking I need to do versus how much like time-lapsing I should do. But long story short, since we're gonna be working on the frets, I'm gonna tape off the, the rest of the thing aboard here. Some more experienced luthiers. I was literally just watching a Tanya Shapachuk video. She's also a great gal that you should check out. She's also in Ukraine and so she's doing Luthery despite the fact that her country is in an active war. So that's pretty cool. Be sure to go and support her and buy some of her Luthier tools to help uh, with that if you have the money. But yeah, Tanya will literally do all this without taping up a fretboard. I am not at Tanya Shapachik levels so I'm gonna go ahead and tape it off. On darker fretboards and stuff like that, really, I've the reason that I'm so hesitant about this is that I've actually smeared, like I had an Ambrosia maple board. You guys may have seen it on the Gang Guitar if you went and check out this video if you haven't here in the upper right. But on the Gang Guitar build, I got to the very, very end and then I was polishing frets and literally it picked up all the dirt from the frets and it just smeared it right across the, the white of the maple and it looked all dirty and that sort of thing. So. That's why I'm very, very hesitant about these sort of things, but we'll get to it. Um, I'm just gonna tape it off. It doesn't take but a couple extra minutes to get everything taped off and it makes for a really satisfying time-lapse. So let's do that. I was thinking about this earlier today that we're starting this new series and you guys are going to see like week to week what it's like working to build a guitar company but i wanted to whenever i watch like other vlogs and like other people that are following their businesses they always have these kind of chats or they talk about stuff that's going on in their life or something that might be valuable and i don't know if that would be valuable in this circumstance but i've got some ideas and some stuff that i really want to talk about so 
as I finish this up. But I got some, many of you guys know that Mad Lad is, or Mad Lad Instruments is just one of a few ventures that I have my hands in right now. The main thing that I'm working on is a platform called Mechanics GG. By the way, go support me on Mechanics GG if you're so inclined. It's the best way to support your favorite creators. It's a lot more fair to creators. 100% of the revenue that you contribute through Mechanics goes directly to the, the creator. We don't take anything off the top of anything. And so when you start a software company, you, I think you initially think that it's going to be all like that show Silicon Valley where you just kind of get in and you cash checks. By the way, I am marking these with Sharpie just so that I know when I go to do the frets or actually level them, what parts have been sanded. So like when I sand over them, the ink will get removed because it'll be sanded off. And then that'll tell me if there's any high or low spots in the fret as I'm sanding it. But you think that you're going to get in and it's going to be super easy. You just built this app, you start, everybody's going to love you and you're going to cash checks. And I was kind of of that naivete too. And my business partner and I, Jordan, we were playing it a little bit on hard mode because we're not taking any outside funding. We're not going the VC route or anything like that. And that fret's going to be really high. This one's going to be fun to work with. Um, so with that, there's an added level of difficulty, but with that, we can maintain creative control and everything. So Mechanics has been operating pretty much at a loss for the last couple of years. That's normal of even companies that are funded, but I've noticed Mechanics kind of has gone through these cyclical sort of moments. One second, I'm gonna grab some sandpaper here. 220 grit ought to do it. Just regular 220 grit sandpaper. My buddies over at 3M. You think that you're gonna cash these checks and everything like that, but when you're building a product, a software product specifically, there's a very cyclical nature to what you do. You start by building features and you know, building what you think your users need, and then you get it in front of them and then they give you feedback and they tell you what they actually need. And then as a software engineer, I tell my clients this, that I'm only ever gonna get about 70% of where I think you need or of what you need. But I mean, I do create content and everything like that, but that's not my daily work. And so there's things that my clients and people that use mechanics are going to run into that I had never thought of. And so that last 30% is what's really gonna make your product great. But the feedback part is the hardest part. And today I was talking with a, a new client actually, and she was very, very helpful. She had gotten the platform mechanics in front of a bunch of her community members and they had some feedback and it was a little bit rough. I don't wanna say it wasn't presented in a rough way that weren't like, yo, your product's trash or anything like that. But it's always hard when, I mean, this is I'm sure with guitars as well, the when somebody when you work on something for very a long time and you surround yourself with people that tell you that it's good and everything and that you're doing a good job which a lot of people have mechanics has been you know it's the benefit of a lot of people and everything it could be a little jarring to get knocked off your horse every once in a while by hey there needs to be some refinement to this you need to work on this i don't think that the site was very user friendly those sort of things and I'm just going to go back and forth on this, by the way. It's getting caught on some things. Usually the first couple strokes are going to get caught on stuff because there's some press that are really, really high and really, really low. But feedback is a beautiful thing. And it's one of the hardest things that young engineers and young entrepreneurs like struggle with, I think. Um, and I struggle with it a little bit myself, too. So today, this afternoon, I was, you know, taking this feedback, or I got this message from this client, and they're like, hey, you know, I've been getting mechanics in front of people, and one of these frets literally just fell off. <laughs> I was wondering, something felt off, but let's get this guy glued back in. Um, but I'm probably going to have to wait for this to set before I can continue leveling. That's one benefit of taping everything off, though, is that it's... Uh, there is 
You don't have to worry about spilling glue all over your fretboard. But anyway, talking to this client, they got it in front of their their audience and everything like that, and I got knocked off my horse a little bit. That's okay. I'm used to it. <laughs> well, I don't want to say that so easily, but it was a really good gut check moment for me, and I kind of went the emotional gamut. And I, know, I think a lot of you guys, if you've ever worked on a product or you've been on this side of what I'm talking about, that you know what I'm talking about. Like, you get knocked off, then the intrusive thoughts tell you that, hey, your product's trash, like all the time that you spent on it, vain, and you're gonna die alone and without any money, and you're not gonna be successful, so stop trying. And then you have your moment, you have your little bit of emotion, you feel frustrated, you wonder why that person would ever like offer the feedback and everything like that. And then you suck it up and you stop feeling sorry for yourself and you remind yourself that what you're doing has value and then you start looking into the feedback. And the first thing that you should always ask yourself is, where is the value in what I am being told right now? Because every piece of feedback that you get, whether it's just like your platform sucks or something like that, there's something that triggered that. And I mean, maybe you suck isn't the, <laughs> the best thing because that's just generic negative feedback. But think about it this way. Think of all the restaurants that you've gone to that you've had a really bad experience or the food was just terrible and you just didn't go back because that place was beyond saving. But let's say you do go to a restaurant and it was really good, the service was good, you liked what was there, there was some merit, as Jordan puts it to it, but there was just something that was a little bit off. You wanna work with that place to make it better. And so that's how you need to view feedback. It's not people attacking your product. That is a very, very short-sighted, juvenile even, I would say, way to look at it. And I'm not saying that there isn't gonna be an instinct in you that says, hey, you know, I wanna dismiss whatever this is saying because they're attacking this thing that I worked on. But if you can work past that point, if you can work past that sort of knee-jerk reaction, just be like, you don't know what you're talking about, like this is great, yada, 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 then you will flourish, you will fly, you will be able to get to the bottom of things that are hurting people, and you'll be able to look at that person and say, hey, I'm sorry you had a bad experience. This is not ideal. Uh, what worked, what didn't work, and then give me another shot. And then what happens, this is the really tricky part. This is the part that they don't tell you. But everybody that gives you feedback is waiting for you to call their bluff. Part of every feedback is a bluff. And not a bluff in the way that you think, but the way that I see it is that Somebody who's giving you feedback is just going to expect that you're going to be this money-grubbing corporate entity or this money-grubbing corporation that says they're all about the people and everything like that. But the minute that you offer them a bit of feedback, you're going to get your head so far up your own butt that you're not going to be able to hear the wind, let alone the feedback of other people. And then you're just not going to do anything and you're going to sit and just pretend to know what you're talking about and know what's best for people. What they're not expecting for you is to come back with specific questions to try and improve the product. And maybe they do, maybe they do expect that. Maybe they're hoping that like, hey, when I offer this feedback, I really hope they circle back. But there are people in this world that will offer feedback with kind of the bluff of saying, hey, I don't know if you're gonna do anything about this. Are you gonna do something about this? And your answer should always be yes. Yes, I'm gonna do something about it. And that will help vindicate you. That'll help you in the moments where you feel like you're really struggling or you feel like you're being attacked and that sort of thing. So the first question should always be, how can I boil this down? What is the value? What is the specific question that I need to ask to follow up on this? So even something as general as like user friendliness, like, okay, that can be a very generic thing. Can you localize it for me? Even if you just tell me this one page sucked. At least that gives me somewhere to look at. But if it's more specific, if they say like, hey, you know, I don't particularly care for the way that you did this feature, that feature, then you can start to ask, okay, well, what did you like, what didn't you like? I got some feedback that like, hey, this isn't as user friendly as another platform that I use. I'm like, okay, what well, do you like about that platform and where do you think mechanics can improve? And then whenever you empower people like that, when you have them follow up, 
they feel a part of it. That now they're part of the process. You call their bluff and you're welcoming them into the dialogue. And then, if you're really, really good, you implement those changes. You say, hey, here's what I'm gonna do. Here's what I'm thinking. Let me get this in front of the right people and everything. And they're like, okay. So now he's saying that he's gonna go and do something about it, but I don't know if I believe him. Let's see if he follows up. And then at every single point, you are putting down those doubts and you are putting down those and they're not just your doubt. They're not just your uh, your critics' doubts. They are your own doubts as well. Because there's, believe it or not, there's a part of your brain. There's something in you that's saying, you know what? Maybe I do just need to give up. And maybe I do just need to call it quits and everything like that. But you don't. You don't want to listen to those voices. There's a really great song, one of the openings for Naruto, the uh, song Closer by Joe Way, And I think about this one line. I'm really just rambling now, I hope you don't mind, but uh, there's a really great line that, in that song, that the closer, uh, the closer you get to something, the harder it is to see it. And so it always gets the hardest when you are just that close. Remember, if your product was shit and the dish or whatever you had in the restaurant wasn't good, you just don't go back. But when there's something to it, when you have something to offer and people see that value, it's just one or two things that they want to give you to like fix, then you know that you're onto something. And those last little bits of conversation, that last little bit of feedback, those last little tweaks, or maybe it's a huge colossal tweak. Maybe you have to go back and just reinvent the whole platform. That's okay too. But when you start calling those bluffs, and again, they're not just your, they're not just your critics' bluffs, they're your bluffs. When you call that voice in your head that's telling you to give up, that's when the real stuff starts to happen. So I am on the precipice of reorganizing and recontextualizing basically all of Mechanics GG, but I have never felt this excited, this exhilarated. I've never felt this challenged in a very, very long time. And to be honest with you, I was having some struggles. Like it was hard for me to get motivated even just this morning. And I posted in one of the discords, I'm like, hey, does anybody else ever feel like you just, you know, can't get started or that sort of thing? And then all this feedback came down and I had this kind of emotional roller coaster this afternoon, but I'm ready. I'm ready to go back and fight for this platform and for this future that I am trying to promise to these people. And I'm calling the bet. I'm calling... I'm calling the bluff, I'm calling the bet that is in the back of my head and maybe in the back of these other people's head. And so feedback is so, so tricky. But if you can learn to disarm it, ask specific questions, call the bluff, and then put into action what you were saying, your product is going to soar. It's going to, and then all those people that were offering you feedback, they become your promoters. They're like, dude, thank you so much for implementing these changes. They're like, I didn't know you had it in you. Honestly, I was wrong. And then those moments you need to be humble. You don't need to like rub it in their face. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, you know, I did all this. You know, why did you doubt me and everything like that? No, you need to be humble. Be humble in those moments. Because those people have made your product so far and away better. And again, they didn't just put in that 30% that you were missing. They put in like the whole 70% that you didn't design in the first place. So they got the whole pie. It's one of those rare times where your users like literally give you the whole pie and your prep platform gets better and you benefit. So the alternative is that you just sit there and you feel sorry for yourself and you have an inferior product just because you couldn't swallow your pride and acknowledge that, you know, you could take feedback. But if you can work around that, then, and you can rise to the, I don't want to use cliches, but if you can work around that, if you can find the other alternative, then that is that you take it on the chin, as Jordan says, you call the bluff, you figure out what you need to do, you implement it, and then your product gets better, and you soar. So think about that. Just a little lesson on taking feedback. I had to take some hard feedback today, feedback that I hadn't had to take in a very, very long while. So, just wanted to share that with you. Hopefully you enjoy it. All while there's this ASMR going in the background. <laughs> so yeah, let me level off the rest of these frets and we'll get back to it. So, as we're leveling everything off, this is what you want to see. This flatness, this isn't good for the fret, but this shows you that these frets are now kind of level. They are level to one another, I should say. 
But naturally, we can't have flat frets. That's not cool. So now we get to step two, and that is crowning the fret. So let's go ahead and do that part now. And for crowning the fret, we get the dagger. This is a Fret Guru Dagger 2.0. This is a lovely little tool. And maybe I'll uh, continue our conversation. I was just thinking as I was doing the time lapse there, there was some other stuff that I wanted to mention, but I hope this is soothing. I don't know if just the sounds of like ASMR help, but I don't know. I enjoy our time together. I'm glad that we have it. And you know, maybe I can just sit here and talk to you a little bit more about some of the stuff that's going on in my life and stuff that's going on in your life, but I wanted to go back to the feedback part and talk a little bit more about that. I, uh, I sent these follow-up questions to this uh, creator, this content partner, and some of the questions were from their community, some of them were from them themselves. And so I, when I sent these follow-up questions, again, calling the bluff, getting, you know, the word out and asking, you know, follow-up questions, I had some solutions in mind or some things. And when I suggested those solutions, they immediately got back to me and said like, oh yeah, like this would be a good idea or that sort of thing. So again, showing that initiative, showing people that, hey, you're trying to create a solution and you're not just some money grubbing corporate entity or something like that, that you genuinely do care about the product and the person that's using it, then that helps. That helps immensely. Um, and so they were very, very thankful and everything. And so, like I said, people aren't used, people aren't expecting you to call the bluff. People are expecting you to just sit in your office and pretend like nothing's wrong. But real people, the people that really want to make better products and make a better world by extension, they call that bluff every single time. And people like to see that. Pe that's what people, like I said, I think there's a part of everybody that offers feedback that thinks that there's going to be, you know, no, nothing that comes of it or that they're small and insignificant because that's what everybody's done before now. But it's so refreshing to them when they finally do get to meet somebody that you know, does genuinely care and like takes their feedback and into consideration and everything. So that's the other side. They're not expecting you to call the bluff, but when they do, or when you do, you're super duper, super duper helpful and thankful. And I guess it's also, there's another lesson in here for me to learn. Firstly, that I need to uh, clean my, my dagger here. But, um, I have a really hard time when people tell me, hey man, your product's great. Or like, you know, I really, really like what you're doing. My inclination in those moments is to do what I've always done and that is to give credit to, it's not just me, it's an odd other of people. I think that's healthy. I think it's healthy to acknowledge that it's not just you, but it's a team of people. And right now it's just me and Jordan. We're the only ones that are like officially on staff at Mechanics, but there's an amazing, and we should also say right now that Mechanics is still operating at a loss. We're still trying to uh, break even consistently, but there's an amazing community and amazing community members that have taken on basically staff work um, are doing the work of staff, I think, of Ulti Page, who's basically heading up our esports stuff right now. And I think about Gamers Lunch Mark and Shank the Noob, who are some other friends. They're uh, part of a testing team that I've kind of formed out of community members, and I put new features in front of them. They dissect it and they get me all the feedback and everything like that. But um, so I want to put the focus on them and the the good that they're doing and rightfully so but I think there's a part of me going back to when I was very very young that I can't tell what forces were at play that taught me that you know those kind of positive words are fleeting I guess I don't know how I want to describe this but it's just like oh it won't last like you need to just work on the next thing or you need to like continue to work on it like they're not being authentic with you they're just saying it to satiate you and that sort of thing and just really not allowing myself to give myself credit for the hard work and everything and I mean it's not just me in this instance I think it is very healthy to talk about the hard work that's been done by our community members and stuff like that but that should not be at the expense of 
my own contributions, I guess. And I think that's the same lesson that I would impart to you, or it's just something that I'm working on. It's not really a lesson that I can impart because I'm working on it myself, but I guess the next time somebody tells you that you've done a good job or you're, they really enjoy what you're doing, um, still be thankful. Be grateful always for people that take time out of their day to remind you of the good that you've done in their life, but celebrate that with them. They're hoping that, you know, their feedback will reach you in such a way that you can celebrate the hard work that you do. And so allow yourself the headspace to do that. Um, open up the, uh, the internal dialogue with yourself to say like, hey, am I really happy with where I'm at? Am I celebrating this in the way that I should be that's healthy? Because, I mean, it's one thing to not want to rest on your laurels. I think we all want to continue to do great things for people. But on the other side of it, there is such a thing as being toxically, like, eyes towards the future and always wanting to do the same thing. It's, uh, it's really a scarcity versus a... Uh, Scarcity versus an abundance problem, I guess you could say. On the one hand, you want to not sit on your laurels and just keep reminding yourself every day that like, oh, this one person said I did a good job so I can stop now. But also you don't want to be so toxic with yourself that it's like, you know, I'm never going to stop and give myself credit. So I'm talking around in circles basically just to say that I'm working on it. I'm trying to celebrate more often when people give me credit and want to celebrate with me some of the things that I've done or things that I've been a part of. And I guess I'm trying to silence that voice, that negative voice that's always been is telling me that, that I'm not doing enough, that all of this good feedback is in vain and people don't actually they don't mean what they say when they say that i did a good job and stuff like that that's vain that's fleeting they don't really mean it i need to work on combating that voice just like i need to work on continuing to crown these frets <laughs> um but yeah i don't know if you've ever felt that way but maybe that helps is there some is that flat or hmm I'm going to go on these ends just a little bit. I'm getting nice in the middle, but here on the edge. This fret guru, by the way, is like cheating. This is a cheat code for fret work. If you don't have one, all my luthier friends, I highly suggest you get one. It like it literally rounds off frets and makes them perfect. In just about no time at all. But if you're like me and you sit here and you ramble with your audience about how great they are and how they should be, kind to themselves and give themselves permission to be happy for the hard work that they do. And you kind of get carried away and you realize that you don't do the edges. <laughs> so I'm going to come back and re-hit these edges, but I'm glad we had this time, friend. I hope that you are, uh, you're celebrating something today that uh, you've worked hard on. And if you don't have something that you've worked hard on recently, then I hope that there's at least something that you're working on or you know, something that you've done in the past, some sort of achievement that you can celebrate because every day deserves its own celebration one way or the other we need to celebrate daily and make it a habit even the little bit we need to celebrate those otherwise we get into this broken mindset that i just described where we always have to keep pushing forward and trying to get that hit where we build something awesome that is to our satisfaction but it's a fleeting satisfaction because we're always going to be wanting more and more, and more so celebrate something today you're doing awesome. Whatever it is that you're doing in life, I think you're right where you need to be. And if you're working hard towards something, make sure you take time to stop and think about the people that have cheered you on along the way. And if there's nobody that's cheered you on along the way, then I can't help but feel it's my responsibility to cheer you on myself. Because maybe other people don't believe in it right now, but maybe that's just a sign that you're ahead of your time. That you got something that nobody's ever seen before and it just takes the right person and the right convincing to believe and so i'm not going to say that i always have perfect future sight or there may be some things that i missed the boat on but 
I know you, and if you're like me, and you came by this video, and you didn't expect to get a philosophy lesson or some words of encouragement, I can only imagine whatever it is you're working on is something special. So I want you to celebrate that. And I want you to know that I'm rooting for you. I'm sure there's people down in the comments or people all around you that are rooting for you too. So just keep going. Call those bluffs wherever they're coming from. Alrighty, those are some shiny threats. They're almost as bright as your future. All right, enough of the sweet talk. Let's get this unpeeled real quick. Oh, boy! Yes! Good morning, good morning. It's Tuesday, I left this on overnight. It's got this beautiful kind of sky blue color, exactly what I'm looking for. We're gonna spray the next layer on that gradient. Let's go. More sanding but you may have also noticed that in the time lapses and stuff like that the the bar that i used to spray the guitar it, it was kind of crooked and so what i'm doing is i'm also making a little jig here i'm gonna make a block of wood that fits into the next slot and then on the back i'm gonna use the typical triangle pattern that all mad lads use at the moment and then on the other side i'll use the actual six millimeter screws and put it in there so it'll be a little bit more secure and it should sit on straight and I should be able to spray a little bit more consistently. Mucho mejor. And now for something completely different. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a dinky. Hey, yo. So, one of the best parts of being a guitar builder or starting to build guitars is that you get to talking to people and you say, hey, I build guitars. They're like, oh, that's so cool. You know, I have this guitar and that guitar. And you quickly go down the road of like talking about guitars and collections and stuff like that. And that's the story on this one. So I have a good friend from church. We'll call him Paul because that's his name. And Paul and I, I minister to Paul's son. Actually, I, he's in my high school youth group. And so I've known him for a little bit or I've known his son for a little bit. We got to talking after one of the youth nights and he said, hey, you know, here's my collection, everything like that. And I mentioned that I build guitars. He's like, oh, that's so cool. Can I come by and see your shop? I said, yeah, absolutely. Come by anytime. And so he texted me last week. He said, hey, I've been, you know, I've needed some work done on one or two of my guitars. Can I bring him by and see the shop and everything? I said, absolutely. Bring him on by. And this is one of the two guitars that he brought my way. The other was a beautiful hand-built acoustic guitar that was made like in the 1980s, 1984, 1985. I can't remember the exact year, but gorgeous, gorgeous dreadnought guitar. I'm sad I didn't get any pictures of it, but it had some beautiful checking on it. And uh, it just, it was a well-loved and great sounding guitar. But on this guy, he came to me and he said, Drew, I want to get the action lower on this guy. And by the way, there's a little bit of buzz here in the 17th or 18th or 19th fret around that area. So took some notes. He said he wanted to get the action low, 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 check the, we checked the neck straightness and everything like that. And I said, okay, let me see if I can get it as close as I can. So the long and the short of it is we're gonna be doing a little bit of a, a job on this guy. You guys get to see me actually working on like a, somebody else's guitar versus building one of my own, which this is a very, very fun 
sort of a little side hustle if you are a guitar player. There's a really great video from Driftwood Guitars about how to start your own kind of tech or luthery business. And there are people that make very, very good money being guitar techs on the order of like 60 to 75 an hour, which is my, uh, my going rate for this sort of stuff. Did give Paul a little bit of love though, so I gave him the friends and family. We're gonna give it a full kind of run through, 13, 14, 15, whatever arbitrary number inspection you wanna go through. And I'm gonna document the process and it'll be a lot of fun. The next part that is also really, really cool about working on other people's guitars is that you learn a lot about the world of guitars out there. And I don't know too, too much about the dinky, so I went and I did a little bit of research and I pulled up this here Wikipedia article and it basically broke it down. So this guitar has actually been in production since 1986, and it's called the Dinky because apparently it is seven eighths the size of a Stratocaster or like a typical full body guitar. I don't know if that's the case on this one. This seems pretty, pretty close to a regular Strat, but I guess there are some other models that may be a little bit smaller, a little bit more petite, a little bit more compact, if you will. But so-called, it's called the Dinky because it is a little bit smaller and Beautiful vernier, that's a fly. Hello, Mr. Fly, can you go away? There we go. The, uh, we're getting into the, the wet months, I guess you can say, end of spring, start of summer, so it's a little bit hotter and humid and we've got more of the, uh, the buggos out. So, but they're friends and they don't cause you too much of a distraction. So yeah. But Jackson Dinky, so-called, because it's a little bit smaller, a little bit more dinky. And there's a ton of different models for this one. And there are, of course, the American Standard ones that have like an alder body with a maple neck. There's no um, marking. Okay, so this is a China-built one, which is a little bit more economical. Look at that scarf joint, though. That's a beautiful scarf joint, even on a, an overseas guitar. Looks like some pretty standard drop-in tuners with some Jackson branding on it. So I'd be willing to bet that they probably worked with a distributor or manufacturer over there and they're just doing it. One thing I really love about Jackson, they're back plates. Mad Lads don't have back plates because I just do the triangle and like do the bolt-in directly. But Jackson has always had really, really beautiful back plate designs. And if I was going to have a back plate, they, I wouldn't follow Jackson's lead. Also, look at the little shelf, the little contour here. That is a, uh, that's something that I built into the Mad Lad designs as well, but it's also cool to kind of see it right here to give it a little bit more comfort when you're up here on the, the higher frets. And it's got a Floyd. Um, the Dinky is meant to be a little bit more economical or it's more of an entry level, but obviously they're at all price points. There's the American Maids and then sure, there's other ones and obviously there's this is the China made one. But it, being an economical guitar, this is like more on the economical end. I didn't ask Paul how much he paid for this one, but um, it's, I can't imagine it was, too too much and to get a licensed Floyd in a guitar at this price point is very very nice. We can probably bring the action down. Oh maybe. Oh that's that is a little bit higher. It's not too bad on this end but the good news is the action is lower naturally up here near the nut which is pretty common. If you're gonna have a guitar with a break angle it's typically the action's gonna be lower towards the top fret but he said hey just get it as low as you possibly can without buzzing and stuff like that. So I can probably just bring this down a little bit and then we'll even out the action down here while keeping this pretty much where it's at. And I'll let us do all those speedy licks right there at the top. Okay, so a lot simpler than I expected. So shout outs to Jackson's quality. Jackson, I mean, I was about to say that Jackson is a company that has been known for their quality and at all their different price points, but then I think about, there's a couple of videos that I've seen recently at their custom shop stuff that's uh, not been the greatest, but I mean, from what I've heard and you know what I've experienced in my own personal experience, Jackson has been a, at least the ones that I've played, they have been solid quality guitars and whether you're getting the built-in USA or the overseas one, they genuinely take care to like make sure that the instruments are, are solid. So to that effect, um, this neck just boiled right in. I was able to get the truss rod. I'm just gently bringing the key out here, but the truss rod behaved perfectly. The neck is sitting much better than it did earlier. And really when you're doing a job like this, the first order of business is to just test the truss rod. First, is it moving? Is it making any difference? Because if not, then you could have a, a truss rod that's just like maxed out or something like that. And 
that's usually the source of a lot of your problems. If you have a truss rod that's under a ton of tension and suddenly you take off of it, then the neck can kind of reset and do what it's meant to do and that is be straight. So, but yeah, when it's not maxed out, you kind of figure out, okay, this way, if I go this way, then the bow, the, uh, the bow goes this way. So you figure out which direction the truss rod wants you to go in. And then once you do that, you just go ever so slightly, check it every once in a while. and. This guy dialed right in. So once I once I got it to purr and I knew which way it wanted to work with me, then it just purred perfectly. So got no gaps, and I'd be willing to bet that probably fixes it on the spot. Um, I'm gonna check the upper frets, just where the problem areas were. And I'll also check the intonation, because I told him when I would do an intonation. Um, there we go. But somebody else's guitar, you're always just a little bit more, a little bit more cautious, but yeah, I think we've got the truss rod just about perfect there. So we can go ahead and put the top plate on. And next order business is intonation. All right, now the intonation was set pretty much from the factory, which is really, really awesome. I just went through and verified everything. So the last order of the day is just getting the action as low as we can possibly get it. And where it's at right now, I think it's actually about as low as it can be. In fact, I think we might have to go a little bit higher because we do have a little bit of buzzing right there around the 17th fret. And so, I think that the neck, the neck sorted out, like getting the neck straight sorted out like 80 to 85%. And I think that the last little bit of adjustment that we just need to do is to adjust the action. And then this gets us into another discussion that I think a lot of people have. And that is, well, Floyds are just way worse to work with and everything like that. And they're really, really fickle and everything like that. And it's like, I don't know. I've worked with, I've heard that same line of reasoning and everything like that. And it's not wrong. I think if you've been building or like working with guitars with stop tails or traditional tremolos um, for the last 20 years, then a Floyd is a little disorienting. But the idea of the double locking tremolo, at least in my opinion, is like brilliant. Yeah, why don't you just lock out the, the tension or the tone at the nut and then lock things down and that'll help with tuning stability way more than having to adjust your tuners every single time. And you basically remove the tuners from the equation. Like you loosen these, you tune it like once a month and then you get the tuning machines right. And then for the, the that next month or so as the strings stretch out and stuff like that, you just use the micro adjusters to get them in tune because you just need micro like adjustments and stuff like that. And yeah, you have to tune them a little bit differently. The, uh, you have to go like three, four, two, five, one, six versus one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, so it's different. Floyds are just different. I don't think that they're necessarily more difficult. And the action is the exact same. A lot of people will say like, oh, it's way harder to adjust the action on the Floyd. And maybe it is, but the cool thing about a Floyd Rose or the double locking tremolo bridge is that there's just these two posts and you just do a single screw and it either brings the whole action up or the whole action down. It's really rough if you need to adjust the stuff on one string. And I feel like there's probably a way to do that that I'm just not aware of, but in this case, I think just bringing the whole action up and just adjusting these little two strings, again, it's different. You're used to like screwing each little saddle piece by piece, but it's different. It's not harder necessarily, it's just different. And life is kind of like that. Sometimes things are a little bit different and they seem a little bit more difficult, but when you get into it, it's just like, oh, this is just a different way of doing things. It's not necessarily harder, it's just different. So that's where we're at. So I'm gonna adjust the action on this guy and we will take this guy home. All right, I've had a chicken pita for dinner, and I went and I took a class on YouTube U. You get that one when you're on your way home. But 
The good news is that I was not like way off the way that you adjust the action on the Floyd is doing exactly what you saw me doing in the last clip, just adjusting the bridge pose up and down. I think a bug just flew in my bleh. Bug just flew in my mouth. A little bit of extra protein. Anyway, so you um one second, I need to drink some water. Okay, the way you adjust a Floyd, the one caveat is just that you take the tension off of the bridge, so you just do your dive bombs, and then you take the pressure off, and then you can adjust it even finer, so that's the one caveat there, but I also learned that the optimal string height or string action is somewhere around 1 16th, but I only have a millimeter ruler, and millimeters are by far the superior of the units so and as i'm doing that i'm realizing that this ruler starts at like starts at the edge so I like it doesn't have like the one millimeter gauge there i could have swore i had like a a ruler somewhere but basically a straight rule but i'm gonna do some quick math and figure out how much a 16th is in centimeters and i'll go from there so as it turns out one sixteenth of an inch is about 1.5 millimeters it's 1.59, so it's actually closer to 1.6, but I am not that precise, at least not with my, uh, my calipers here. So what I'm gonna do is basically check. Whoa, okay. That's a little high, even more so down there. Okay, so base needs base side needs to come down just a little bit. We can come down on that just a little bit. Let's see what we got here. Still come down a fair bit. This side is pretty much there. That is right on top of some button. But anyway, so this is this is my life. I'm going to get this down to about a 1.5, see how that feels, and then I might be able to just tweak it a little bit more and get it just a little bit lower without getting so much fret buzz. And this E string or this uh, B string is... It's getting there. So we are nearly there. These are the last little tweaks, and I'm gonna get this as low as I possibly can. We got the action set up on this guy. I got it to about one and a half mil or one sixteenth, which is pretty standard. I checked the notes and didn't hear any buzzing at these top frets, which is really, really great. So that solves all of our problems as far as what was on the bill. But you guys know with the Mad Lab job, we're not just gonna do the bare minimum. So I'm gonna get this guy dressed up. I'm gonna give it a nice clean, wipe down the top here, see a little bit of splotching, a little bit of uh, some skin flaking and everything around the pickup. So let's just get that looking good and looking nice. And then I'm gonna get some nice B-reel and riff on this guy for a little bit for archival purposes, you know? Of course, this is a historic event. You know, I'm doing this repair as like a first sort of setup and job on the, the channel. But also I think it's really cool that as I work on these guitars and stuff like that, or as stuff comes across my bench, it'd be really, really cool to like kind of dress everything up, take some B-reel and archive it and then go riff on it so that you guys can hear all these different guitars and all the cool stuff that comes across my bench. And this is a gorgeous, gorgeous guitar. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay, this is a gorgeous guitar. And most of it comes down to this beautiful curly maple vernier on the top. And most of you guys probably know what a vernier is, but in case not, vernier is basically like a really, really thin sheet of wood that you can you, you can put over the top of another piece of wood to give the illusion that the whole cut of wood or the whole body or whatever it is that you're putting on it is made of that one material, but it's just a little thin sheet of that material on top of usually a sturdier or more... I don't want to say economical, but another cut of wood that would make sense, like a structural piece of wood or something like that. So veneers are used to like add a little bit of aesthetic while still allowing the wood behind it to be structurally sound and stuff like that. So gorgeous top on this guitar, gorgeous curly maple veneer. And this is a really, really bright cut of maple. And I don't know why, but this fret, the 12th fret and the up here as well, it looks, I don't know, it looks kind of... I don't want to say it was like chopped in or spliced in or anything like that, but it's very interesting that you have this grain pattern and there's just like a straight streak. And then over here, there's some like denser fibers and stuff like that. That said, I have seen some cuts of maple and stuff like that, where you have these really dense like striations that go through with the rest of these like smaller like patterns and stuff like that too. So it's probably just a really, really dense or very, very fibrous part of the wood, but it's just kind of interesting. I don't know, cause like they usually go up and down. So I guess maybe this cut of the neck, they cut the blank out like this way. And so it's running left to right. Again, just one of those things that I pick up as somebody who works with wood on the regular, but it's not bad. It doesn't look bad at all. It's just a little bit different. And like I said, with the Floyd Rose rant that I went on with a little bit earlier, things can just be a little bit different and that's okay. But all in all, solid. This guitar just feels solid. And it's hard to describe, but like it's solid. It like it's complete. The neck works really well with the body and like the screws and everything, just the fit and finish. Everything fits and looks good. There's nothing really sloppy about it. The switch feels good. It's nice in place. Both of these like knobs are in place. So Kudos to Jackson on this one, Jackson China specifically. And like I said, I know that there's been some QA issues and stuff recently. And I just heard about these things in passing. You hope for every guitar builder out there that when you have QC issues, you don't want to have like long-term QC. Yeah, man, um, and gals and non-binary pals, but I was riffing around on it a little bit before getting the uh, camera angles right, but uh, it's kind of fun because this is in, it's dropped a half step, so it's D sharp, H, um, D sharp, D sharp, yeah. It's a half step down, so it's kind of, it's kind of fun as a guitar player because it's not drop D, so technically everything else is, so everything is dropped like one step, so all the riffs that you want to play or you normally play, um, you just move it one fret up. So I'm like, okay, how do I do Blitzkrieg Bop? Or like, you do that, but then you just move it one fret up and it's like, oh, there it is. There it is. 
But yeah, the uh, the humbucker on this guy is really, really nice. It's got a really nice punchy kind of punk sound to it. Hence why, you know, I was doing it. But nice power chords. Like really nice power chords. Like there's a lot of like, it picks up the pick attack, which is really, really solid. Um, that's not something you get from every single pickup out there. Um, it's got a nice... Like it picks up the, the pick attack really, really nicely. So really, really liking this humbug. So yeah, I, the one thing I would say is just, it is a little bit muddy, but it could be my drive. So if I turn my, my overdrive off. Nice kind of edge of breakup tone too. So you roll off it a little bit. You have the... Uh, Yeah, really nice, like kind of clean tone, but then you bring it up a little bit and you get, it. you get it to start to break up a little bit. So very, very dynamic pickup. Really, really like it. I'm wondering what the other ones sound like. I've been playing around with them just a little bit, but I was really playing with the hum. Maybe bring it back a little bit. It's a little muddy. Bear with me here. Hold on. They're definitely a little bit more bassy. Like I'm getting a lot more bass and mid out of it. But that's, it's got some nice punch to it. I'm using all these fluffy words that like, I always swear off pick, pick up reviewers for using like, oh, it's fluffy or it's punchy, that sort of thing. But yeah, definitely a lot more definition on the lower tones in my opinion. Which I mean, you shouldn't profile guitars and guitar builders, but I've always known Jackson as like a little bit more heavy on the heavier side. So having a little bit more bass response and stuff like that. Okay, hold on. That was like a nice little jazzy chord there. Make sure my tone knob is all the way up. Yeah, all in all, just like a really nice bassy, like middley, really nice attack kind of guitar. Like I really like the response that I'm that I get from these pickups. Yeah, these are solid. I mean, it's solid. The the build construction is solid, and I mean, it's a lower radius. I think this is an eleven, or is this a compound? No, it's the same. It's the same across the whole fretboard, but. It feels a little bit like a board when I'm considering that like most Mad Lads, actually all Mad Lads at the moment have 9.5 inch radiuses, so more that stratty kind of C-neck, but it's nice. I mean, if you're gonna get up here and shred, then it might be nice to have a little bit more of a flat, a little bit more to grip on sort of feel, but all around fantastic guitar. I wouldn't mind having one of these in my collection. Just look at that cherry, like that cherry curly maple top or curly maple veneer, I should say. But it's gotten me feeling some kind of way. Like I want to build like a cherry red, like Mad Lad Super S that looks just like this. And it's got me inspired. This is exactly why I like doing luthier jobs and like doing jobs like this because you pick up a lot of inspiration for your own stuff. On a scale, if I'm like really, really hungry and like I go down and I sit at a Chinese restaurant because this is where I was last night. I went to a Chinese restaurant and I was just really, really craving a plate of beef fried rice. And so this is the equivalent of like getting a really nice plate of beef fried rice from a really good local Chinese shop when you are really, really, really craving some beef fried rice. 
if that's a really weird analogy, I don't care. I think it matches perfectly, but uh, this is like a nice steamy pile of beef fried rice when you want beef fried rice and only beef fried rice. So with that, let's get back to building. Okay, so here we are. Everything is sanded back, and I realize a lot of this looks gnarly, but don't worry. Whenever polycrylic is sanded, it usually gets this kind of splotchy thing, or splotchy look to it, but once you actually start spraying more coats of clear coat over it and you sand it back, all this kind of goes away. So, looking really, really clean. There are some touch-up areas that I need to hit, so around here, here, and then on the back, really, there's just a lot going on here, so. I ordered a smaller spray gun and I'm gonna come in and I'm just gonna gently touch off and hit all the areas around the edges and stuff like that. And I promise you that this is sanded down and everything like that. Like I was just as mortified when I saw this, but have a little faith. I'm confident that we can put down the right color and get it all looking uniform and to Madland standard. But just look at that gradient, absolutely gorgeous. Also a little bit of overspray here, but I'm gonna touch that up as well. So we just have to wait for that spray gun to come in. I ordered it on Amazon, so it's gonna be a couple, or like a day or two, I think it's coming in tomorrow. But in the meantime, we can come back to this guy and where did I put that nut? I literally, I 3D printed a nut and in case you didn't know all the Mad Lab nuts and there's a good portion of components that I 3D print in house. So for one, it's just a huge flex to say like, yeah, I 3D printed that. <laughs> um, so, controlling literally everything down to the nut and everything. Plus, I mean, nuts are a little bit expensive. There's a fair bit of markup on it. But for a nice quality nut, like a bone nut and stuff like that, I think it's worth the price. But I was just ordering like plastic nuts off of Amazon. I'm like, oh, I could 3D print these and do it a lot better. So I also get a lot more control with that because like if I 3D print the nut and it's a little bit too high or like I sand into it or I um, file into it a little bit too much, I could just take it off and 3D print a new one. And so we're good there and I don't have to order and just keep burning $10 bills when it comes to the nuts. So we could get the nut mounted on this guy and then I think we'll be ready to swap this for the other one or the other neck. So it is ready to go on and I will need to retouch the paint on this guy because it looks like it peeled off just a little bit. So, so much to do, so little time, but I'm glad you guys are here watching it with me. Let's get into it. Okay, so you saw me bring out Mr. File on that one. So I had to break down the, the little area up here. Basically, long story short, this is the fretboard or the program that I used to cut the fret slots and then the nut slot was a little bit older. I've since like moved on, but I think I was using the old file and that's why I cut that little notch. So I just filed down the whole area and I put this bigger, better nut assembly up there. And so that's why you see me had to like work everything down and everything, all that with the file. But I will get it updated in the, the files and everything like that. So moving forward, the machine actually cuts this part. But a little bit of handiwork never hurt. And there's a larger discussion. We won't get into it today, but I do want to do a future sort of shop talk on what you consider a hand-built guitar, because that is like kind of a loaded statement in the world of guitars. Long story short, I heard it very wisely said that there's no machine that you really just throw parts into and then out pops a guitar. There's always some level of human interactivity with instrument building. A human has to assemble and check and intonate and work with the instrument. So in that way, every single guitar that you buy, no matter where you buy it from or where it was created, is hand built to some extent because somebody had to build the pieces together to make the instrument and they do that with their hands. But I think what a lot of people mean when they say hand built is more hand tooled. So people will use like hand tools and rasps and chisels and stuff like that to work the material and props to them. I can appreciate that as a woodworker and, you know, as a patron of the art of woodworking, but that ain't me chief. Like that couldn't be me. I much prefer to use a CNC machine that is a lot more precise and can repeat things a lot more consistently than I can. 
and my hands are only, I'm only gonna get older, my hands are only gonna get shakier, but a machine will be able to repeat my designs and everything like that pretty consistently. And so that's why I go the route that I do. But again, no hate against anybody that does like hand crafted or hand tooled guitars, because that, that is an art unto itself, it's just not me. But let me know down in the comments, what do you consider a hand built guitar? You gotta celebrate the little victories in life. And after like 20 to 30 minutes of sanding, the little victory is 13 and a quarter, dead on the 12th fret. And then from the 12th fret up to the saddle, 13 and a quarter, dead on. A perfect 26.5 inch scale length. I don't think I could have got it any more dimensionally accurate than I did. And it feels good. Like I said, it's just about those little victories in life. So I'm very, very excited. So next, I realized that I recorded that whole time-lapse section without actually seeing the headstock. So I haven't put the tuning machines on this one yet, but guys, gals, non-binary pals, look at that profile. Look at that neck. A little bit like tiger stripes from the back. I'm looking at it in the reflection of my, my dad's car. And it's just like, this is, this is amazing. Oh, I'm just so blessed to be able to work with materials like this. Alrighty, so as you saw, and as you can see, there's a ton of projects going on here, but this is called the Master Paint System, I believe, MPS. And so what it is, is you have these little liners, they're a little bit thin, and you put them into this cup, and this cup has all the graduations on it, so basically you can measure everything out and get your ratios right. More for like auto paint and stuff like that, where you have to mix everything in certain ratios. For me, it's not that complex, but... It is really cool because with this and an adapter, you can actually use these tops with the little nib or the screw top on them, and it actually screws into your paint gun. So these double as like a paint container and you can put finish or paint or whatever you want into them and store them. That's what I have done down here. And as you can see, I was moving all the stuff that I have in jars over to this. So here we have just some regular clear coat, I believe. So I'm gonna drop that in here. And what's also really, really cool about these particular lids is that they have a fine mesh. I think this is 125 micron. It's kind of hard to see, but there is a filter on there. So as it's upside down and you're spraying, it also actively filters the, the thing and keeps all the particulates and stuff out of your paint. So really, really innovative, really, really cool in my opinion. And so I just, like I said, went through the process of putting everything in here and I'm kind of organizing it based on color. So you have white, blue, violet, and that's like a really, really deep, almost like cherry red. So that is all set up and ready to spray at any day. And I can basically keep better track of the colors that I use. And then I just wash these jars out and I reuse them for other stuff. So really, really cool unboxing. Give it a 17 out of 10. All right, so back to this lad. We are in the process of moving all these machine heads over to that one. By the way, if you're wondering where this one went, it kind of just fell out. There's a little retaining nut on the bottom that like screws in that fell off, but I'm sure I can find a replacement for it and get it screwed back in. So if you are the lovely purchaser of this particular guitar and you pull off one of the retaining screws on the back and you see one nut is slightly different than the others, 
just call it a, uh, a Mad Lad special. It's a secret between you and I. So let's go ahead and move these over. And that'll do it for this week. So we got a lot done. We got to do a luthery job on that wonderful dinky from our good friend Paul. We basically transplanted a neck. And we got to start on a really, really cool Super S for our favorite anime boy, Mr. Satoru Gojo. So lots of cool stuff going into week number two. Be sure that you are like commenting and subscribing so that you can be notified whenever the next episode comes out. But Got a lot of cool stuff in the pipe, and I've got some design work that I'll be doing next week, so you guys will get to see me kind of design a guitar from scratch, but you'll get to see a little bit of the back end of my design as well and realize that it's not all from scratch. I kind of have some templates and some basic stuff already outlined, but you'll see a peek into the design work that goes into actually manufacturing one of these because you have to plug something into the CNC machine and you have to have some sort of dimensions or some sort of model to build everything around. And so we'll get to take a deep dive into that next week. So, but for now, just another reminder, thank you so much for your time. Time is one of those only things that we can't get back. And so you spending some of your precious time to watch me build these incredible instruments and share some of your afternoon, evening, morning, whatever time you watch with me, that means the world. So thank you truly. If you are interested in supporting the channel financially and supporting the endeavor, supporting our favorite burgeoning guitar and instrument company, you can check out my Mechanics UG page. As full disclosure, I am one of the software engineers on Mechanics UG and I co-own Mechanics UG, but I believe in our product. I believe in what it does and empowering creators and putting more into their pockets. So when you support me on Mechanics UG, you are supporting not just me, but other creators and our collective vision of putting the future of esports and the future of content creation back into creators' hands. And the way that we do that is we give 100% of whatever is contributed to creators. So if you support me at $5 a month, even, even the lowest tier, all $5 of that is going my way. And there's also way more transparency with how we handle fees and stuff like that too, because we do have to pay the bills. Um, Stripe, our payment processor charges as a standard fee and we have to put some money into our pockets to keep the platform running. So we do have to pay some bills that way, but the fee structure that we have is much more fair than any other platform out there. And it's a lot more flexible. So you actually get a choice. So be sure to check out the Mechanics GG link down below. There's different tiers with different perks, including having your name right here at the end of the video. So definitely be on the lookout for that and any future subscribers, you get a shout out and you get your name on the video and a lot of other cool stuff. So definitely go check that out if you're inclined. But more than that, just thank you for watching. Always remember that you are wanted, you are loved, and you are appreciated. You have a special talent that nobody else has and the world is waiting on you to bring it out. So muster a little courage, go out into the world and change it. That's what the world's waiting on, you. Till next time guys, be good to one another and we'll see you on the next Descent into Madness.